First, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar, Ready, Aim, Hired. Ready, you've done assessment and have taken inventory of your skills and passions. Aim, based on this inventory, you targeted positions where you will succeed and flourish. Get hired. Only 10 to 20 percent of job offers come through ads or recruiters, so don't spend 100 percent of your search there. Our main objectives for today's webinar are to offer you actionable advice in how to evaluate and define the progress of your job search, build ongoing networking relationships, and gain access to the hidden job market, to 80 percent of jobs that are never advertised. A quick note on today's agenda, we'll be hearing a presentation from our featured speaker, Moshe Kravitz, and then we'll move to a Q&A session where we will spend the remainder of our hour. We would like this to be an interactive experience for you. So if you have any questions at any time, please go to the questions area in your GoToWebinar control panel and send us your questions. We can't promise to get all of them in, but we will do our best and we'll follow up afterwards on any questions we did not get to. A few logistical notes. The presentation um, from today's webinar is already on the Performative site, where it's freely available, like everything on Performative, and we will be sending you a link to the deck later today. Another note, we will also be offering CPE credits for the CPAs in today's audience. If you didn't check the box on the way in for CPA credits, on the last slide of our presentation, there will be the email address of our CPE events manager, Tanya Walsh. And Tanya will also be sending you an email letter today, and her email address will be available to theirs for you there as well. A quick word about Performative. Performative is the largest and fastest growing online resource for senior level corporate finance, treasury, and accounting professionals. Performative offers a uniquely noise-free and valuable online peer network, direct subject matter advice, and features and resources developed in direct collaboration with our constituency. Okay, let's get started by introducing today's first speaker. Moshe Kravitz, Certified 5 O'Clock Club Career Coach. Moshe guides his clients in selecting appropriate targets and in marketing, in marketing themselves effectively. His experience includes many years as an educator, actuarial positions at CNA Insurance and Buck Consultants, and his, and his position as Director of Financial Planning and Analysis in a major telecommunications energy company. Everywhere he works, Moshe demonstrates a passion for helping others to improve their skills and efficiency. With this passion, he helps job seekers to hone their job search skills, enabling them to land offers more quickly and at higher salaries. With that, it's my distinct pleasure to hand it over to Moshe. Moshe, take it away. Thank you, Ernie, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hope that you find this morning's presentation uh, interesting, engaging, and especially um, valuable. A desperate man walked into the office of a major career coaching organization and he said, you've got to help me. You've got to help me. Please get me a job. And uh, kind people said, that's what we're here for. We're here to help you. Tonight we have a lecture and uh, we invite you to join us. It's about networking, how to build your network of contacts that will um, strengthen and lengthen your reach into possible job options, job opportunities. He said, I don't have time. Uh, I got laid off. I have a wife and kids to feed. Please, please help me get a job. We'd love to help you. That's what we're set up for. Um, after the lecture, we have a small group session, which will help you to strategize and apply the concepts that you learn into your own unique situation. I don't have time. And he left. One year later, a more desperate man walked into the same office and he said, please, please help me. I'm desperate. I was laid off a year ago and I have a wife and kids and they went through the same conversation except this time he said yes and he attended and he learned the skills and he got a job. I won't read the words to you here. You can see them on your own on the screen. Honing skills, the job search skills has a big return. So the aim of this series of webinars is to impart some of the basics in order to enable people to be effective and be successful in a job search. Um, the uh, first two webinars focused on, like it says in the title, like Ernie read off to us, ready, aim higher. We'll review them briefly. Ready 
taught us to prepare and how to prepare an inventory of our skills and passions that enables us to create our positioning statement, our PDA file, as it were, where you position yourself, what do you do at what level, how are you differentiated from the rest of the competition, why should I take you instead of everybody else, and finally, quantify your accomplishments. We'll give you just one example. Um, if he says, I'm a CFO, that's not yet a positioning statement. I'm a CFO of a $1 billion company. Oh, we're getting there. $1 billion financial services company. Okay. Differentiating yourself can be done in various ways. It could be done based on your education. If you went to Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, that certainly differentiates you. It could be done based on your technical skills. It could be done based on uh, your soft skills. Uh, in our example, he might say that he's well known for achieving cooperation amongst all the various silos. IT and marketing and, and, and operations and finance and under his uh, stewardship they work together and they accomplish a lot. And one of his accomplishments might be um, that he just completed a project of replacing a hundred plus legacy systems into one integrated solution that was done on time and on budget and now uh, a revision to budget that used to require two weeks can be done in 20 minutes. This example I did not make up. I heard it from a finance executive. So we learned how to position, how to create our um, PDA file, which we use for a pitch. We use it for a cover letter. We use it to build a resume. We use it as the structure of our interview. And we use it to aim to select those target industries and companies where we are most likely to succeed given our skills and passion. And we use the personal and professional goals that we developed through the assessment to rank those targets, which are most appropriate to me with my skills and my personal goals, which will lead most likely towards my long-term goals. Okay, today we focus on the step of getting hired. You've probably heard, may have heard, that only 10 to 20 percent of jobs that are offered ever got published, either through an ad, through a recruiter, and so. Uh, like a smart fisherman, you have to know where to fish. Yeah. My father-in-law was an avid fisherman, avid fisherman, and he knew where to go. And this whether you fish in that spot, and looking at this, knowing nothing else, we'd say, don't do like many people do, devoting 100% of their time and effort clicking through those ads and calling recruiters. If so, he's dedicating all of his efforts to at maximum 20% of the opportunities. Spread it at least uh, 10, 20 and 80. However, if you do see that ads and or recruiters is working for you, it's resulting in meetings, it's resulting in interviews. So. Give it time. Give it effort. Give it 30, 40 percent of your time and effort. But don't forsake the hidden job market where most of the opportunities lie. Now, another use for looking at ads um, is for market research, meaning you see a company that's hiring. So that is a hot company which has experienced probably growth, has some growth plans built in, you know that that's a good company to target. Don't necessarily spend this time clicking through that ad, which has a thousand other people clicking through. But take that market research information and devise a way to get to the hiring manager in that company, which you see is a growing company, and then you have a much better chance of getting a position in that company. So the question is, how do you get to this hidden job market? We'll get to that. A word first on recruiters is that the first thing to keep in mind about recruiters is they do not work for you. They're not working for the job seeker. As much as they sound like they are, but they work for the company that pays them, the hiring employer, the hiring manager. Nonetheless, it's worthwhile to develop 
a relationship with the recruiter in advance of when the person might anticipate or not anticipate having to need the services of a recruiter, and not all recruiters are created equal. Ask friends whom they use. If they were satisfied, maybe find out whom your company uses. Now, let's see about getting to that hidden job market. How do you get to that 80 or 90 percent of jobs which are never advertised? And by the way, the higher your level, the greater the percentage of jobs that are not advertised. How do we get there? Three ways over here, and that's not a typo. They asked me. I took extra effort to put LinkedIn upside down over there because LinkedIn is 180 degree turn different from the classical way of finding a job. Traditionally, you seek out a company, you try to present yourself to that company. When you have a profile on LinkedIn, the company finds you. I know of one hiring manager who does a lot of hiring every year. And for years already, he's done all of his hiring on LinkedIn. They go look at the job titles, look at the profiles posted there, look at the experience, and they handpick their candidates. So you need to be on LinkedIn with a compelling profile. Our focus today will be on the more traditional methods of networking and direct contact, which get you into that 80, 90% of job opportunities. Now, another mistake that people commonly make is they waste their networking opportunities. Joe tells you, oh, see my friend Sam, speak to him, he'll be able to help you out. So you call up Sam, Sam, Joe sent me, do you have any openings? Uh, if you did, would you, would, you, would, you, would you consider me? Networking, like you see here on the screen, is not a binary function, yes or no. You ask your two questions and now the conversation is finished. Closed end question. Networking is a continuous function. It's an opportunity to develop an ongoing relationship. You're in touch with the person once. You 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 create a relationship, and you create at that point a way of remaining connected. Would you mind if I contact you again in a few weeks, a month from now, two months from now? And each time you're in contact, you increase, you build the trust. And you, you use it and build it as an ongoing relationship. We'll speak more about that as we go on. First, the difference, or the little definition. What's the difference between networking and direct contact? Networking, so to speak, is a warm call because um, both you and Sam are familiar with a common friend, Joe. He sent you to Sam, so that's your warm call. So Sam is ready, uh, interested to hear from you. Uh, word of caution, before you call, be prepared. Because sometimes Joe may not be your best friend. Sometimes Joe might be the fellow who was reading the paper on the train this morning, and he happened to notice what you're doing. You talk up a conversation, you're impressed with him, and you call up Sam. Sam says, oh, great to hear. How's Joe doing? How do you know him? Um, you don't want to be caught in that embarrassing position. So know something about the person who referred you. Know something about his relationship with the person to whom he referred you, and know why he thinks you should speak to Sam. Why does he think Sam should be able to help you? So you're prepared and not embarrassed in case Sam asks you those questions. Now, a question that many people may wonder is uh, whether it's networking a warm call, direct contact, a cold call, um, why should that person agree <coughs> to spend time with me the last for 5, 10, 15 minutes of telephone time of uh, maybe I'll come in and meet, meet with him, go out for a coffee or a lunch. Why would he agree? So keep in mind that many people have a heart. They have a heart to help out another person, especially if they've been in the same predicament or same situation, call it, as the person who is contacting them. And most of us probably have been through transition, anticipated transition, and we have a heart for helping out others. Um, but be sincere. Be sincere because the person could tell. You're just trying to use them or uh, you're sincere in um, respecting their time, in needing the information 
that you're asking them to take their time and effort and to provide to you be sincere. <clears throat> also, in terms of being prepared before you call your networking contact, whether it's networking or warm call, whether it's direct contact where you have to create the connection yourself. Either way, be prepared um, to know about the person whom you're calling. Um, do some research. And also, as part of your sincerity, he'll see, here's a person who's taken initiative and he's done his homework. Know about the industry that the person is in and a little about the company that he's in. And know a little bit, if you can, about the person. Ask Joe about this person. You go on his business website and look to see uh, what you can about him. Here's a link to a previous webinar where we gave a, a few resources that you could use to research industries, companies, individuals. So do your homework. That's part of being prepared before you call your networking contact. Now, interesting to discuss some of the benefits of doing this research before you call your networking contact. Like we said, it shows the initiative. And believe it or not, if you do this homework, which seems so obvious and so worthwhile, and even a responsibility for you to do your homework before you go and bother somebody, this information that's available that you could get without bothering him, why didn't you get it on your own? It will distinguish you from most other people who don't bother. They don't do their homework and that will distinguish you from most of those people. Furthermore, the information that you glean will enable you to ask better questions when you do have an opportunity to speak with this person. And I'll tell you one story of unexpected benefits by doing the research on your own. There was a bank executive who only wanted that his career coach should do the research. He was looking for position, an executive position in banking in Long Island. The career coach should do the research for him and find the contact people. The coach insisted the executive should do it on his own, and not because the coach was lazy, but he knew it was in the best interest of the client, and the coach, coach's way did prevail. Bank executive did do the research on his own, and wow, what did he find? He came across names, oh, names he remembered from grad school, names of people he had worked with years before. No coach, no other person could have recognized those names as people who are known first person to this executive. So that was an unexpected benefit of him doing the research on his own, and there are many other benefits. Now, um, in terms of a direct contact, that may be a person whom you've identified as a person whom you feel would be able to help you. The information that he has, perhaps the connections that he has, but you couldn't find anybody who knows him to make it a warm call. So you're not lost. You can create the connection yourself. Just on the side, I spoke with a young man who's starting out in selling life insurance. And I gave him a chance to come over, practice his pitch with me, and I asked him uh, about making warm calls and cold calls. He's a good person for this type of work, and he has a good attitude, and he says, a eh, cold call after you say hello then it's a warm call. Anyway, you can make a cold call into a warm call. You create the connection. How do you do that? So um, I'll tell you um, an example of um, at a CFO conference. Um, there was a person speaking about using analytics to help drive efficiency in the HR function, not many companies are doing that, but uh, let's say that a CFO had attended that conference or uh, read the notes about that conference. So he goes ahead and he contacts that speaker and says, I heard you discussing that. I find it very intriguing. You know, I've been using uh, analytics for years to help, uh, help our marketing function, um, but it's very intriguing. Would you mind to spend a few minutes to tell me you know, how that works, how it can be leveraged, how it can be used in HR. This CFO in trying to establish this connection with this person may not even be in transition right now. He might be. And uh, he can be upfront about it. But uh, he might be like um, 
uh, if those familiar with Stephen Covey, you, quadrant two. Sometimes he spends part of his day building out skills and building out connections that will help him in the long run. Because he, he realizes that, uh, busy and desirable as he is in his current work environment with his current skill set, you have to keep growing so that you don't fall behind. And he sees that uh, applying analytics in HR may be a thing of the future if he's positioned well with some knowledge, with some skills in that area that may serve him well to distinguish himself from another candidate should that be necessary in, 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 the, in the years ahead. Okay, so that was an example how you could go ahead and create a connection with another person. And here's a list of many places to look to find some topic of interest to use to create that connection. Maybe he wrote something or he's quoted, look in the company website, look at his LinkedIn profile, look at the group that he's in. Somebody contacted me, I said, where'd you, where'd you, how'd you come to me? Oh, I saw you were in this LinkedIn group, I thought, uh, you know, we could have something in common, which was true. Look at the LinkedIn groups that he's in. Maybe he posted some article to LinkedIn. You can follow up on that idea. Follow him on Twitter, see what he's tweeting about. Follow up on one of those ideas. There's many ways, if you have your mindset to it, to find a way to connect with that individual. There is a, a, a limit, though, to how many people you can contact like that. It takes time, it takes effort, and you might have identified 50 or 100 country, companies or individuals whom you'd like to reach. So you can't do it for so many people. So there's another approach. What we've been discussing is called targeted. Targeted mail, targeted email. You follow up with a phone call. You do both, uh, mail and phone call. Uh, that's for these individuals. How many can you do? Five, 10, maybe 20. If you have more, so then you use what we call a direct mail campaign. You write a letter. But write this letter to one individual. Write it to a person whom you know, because it comes out different than if you just write it as a generic letter. Write it directly, personally, to a person that you know, but write it generic enough that you can send it out to, to your 50 or 100 people, and um, you'll see how much response that you're able to get from such a direct mail campaign. It's another way to create uh, direct contact. Now, what do you discuss when you finally got there and he, and, he, and he agrees to give you 10 minutes? So I'll tell you a story. I heard this directly from an executive recruiter. A CFO contacted her. They had a conversation, typical conversation. The CFO was interested in help from the recruiter uh, to position him to certain companies. When that typical part of the conversation was finished, the CFO said to the recruiter, now, how can I help you? Excuse me? How can I help you? Is there something that I could do that could benefit you? Perhaps you'd like an in at certain companies? She said, yes, indeed. And she named the companies. And he was able to, uh, he, he had connections in those companies. He was able to help her, give her an in recommendation at those companies. And she said, now keep in mind what we said before that a recruiter doesn't work for the client. The recruiter works for the hiring company. She's now working for that client because he helped. He was sincere and he gave something of value and he made an impression and it lasts. She'll think first of him before thinking of others. And she's there. That established a relationship. So that is step one in building your network as a continuous function, it's not a binary function. Building an ongoing relationship helps the person. Give something to them which is valuable. Here, the CFO gave something which is ultimately valuable, business opportunities to this recruiter. It doesn't have to be that type of thing. It could be other types of things also. Um, once you know them, it could be even something unrelated to their career. If they're very avid in uh, stamp collecting, antiques, or something like that, um, it could be a piece of information. One person I I, uh, whom I knew and ran into, he gave me a piece of information. He said, um, do you know that um, Doug Hubbard will be speaking at the next CFO uh, conference? Wow, I ran to sign up. And I still remember that person to this day, and I'm thankful to him for telling me about that. Um, in case you don't know about Doug Hubbard, 
read, go up, go look up his book. The first book that he wrote is called How to Measure Anything. It's about quantifying intangibles, and um, if you read it, you'll find that uh, it influences your attitude towards your work and it, it upgrades the, the level of your work product. It's great. Anyway, so he gave me that bit of information, and uh, I'm still appreciative. So um, that's a way that you can give something to a person. Next, besides helping them, help them to help you. We mentioned at the beginning your PDA. Use it for your pitch. And don't even call a prospective networking contact until you have your pitch down. You can say it in 15, 20 seconds, and it's clear, it resounds, it gives the message that you want to give, and that will help them to go and sell you to somebody else. If they think of somebody and they want to refer you to that person and they describe you to that person, you gave them something concise, clear, and compelling to use to present you to their friend, to their associate. So help them to help you. Now, the questions that you ask of any networking contact should be their questions that require somebody at their level of expertise. Yeah? If a CFO has been in the financial services, he's changing over to pharmaceutical. I would not suggest that the first call that he makes should be to a CFO in pharmaceutical. Start with people a few levels down and read also, and learn, and equip yourself with as much information as you can. Then take your experience as a CFO. Uh, together with that basic knowledge you have about the industry, then contact the CFO in pharmaceuticals to ask questions um, that require somebody at his level to answer. And work, prepare a list of appropriate questions so that you're asking the right questions of the right people. So appreciate that also, the fact that you did your homework. What should you ask about? From the general to the specific, ask about the industry. Now, these questions are both for somebody who's changing and is new to the industry. He'll be asking more basic questions. But even a person who's, who's networking within his own industry, uh, a person doesn't know everything. It's valuable to get another expert's perspective on where he sees the trends in this industry, where he sees growth in the next few years where he sees decline. And similarly, um, about the company, if it's the company of interest where the person is working, or if you want to ask him about a different company, do the work that you can beforehand to find out whatever you can, and then use this person's precious time to fill in uh, the gaps, the information that you are not otherwise able to get. Same thing about the position. And find out also about the contact person, because that's also part of creating the relationship so that um, it can be something which uh, continues. Example about uh, getting information about a company. Let's say through your networking, you find out about, about a particular company. It's not known as, in, as, in, as having much international presence but your networking contact happens to know. He may be inside the company, he may be associated with the company, that uh, of late they have been developing a more and stronger international presence. And he knows also that they're really lacking in the executive skill set for running an uh, enterprise with international presence. Information like that could be worth gold. If you happen to be a CFO with 16 years of, of experience with international corporations, you put that on the top of whatever document you send when you contact that company. You may not have featured that information when you applied to other firms because it was irrelevant to them. But now that you got this information, you put it on top and that resume will probably be selected, and you'll probably be called in. That's how networking can provide information which can serve you to leverage yourself, position yourself properly in your search. Other type of questions um, you could ask. Sometimes it's interesting and, and valuable to know about um, important events in the history of a company, how did it develop, how has it evolved, 
um, who are the competitors, what type of organization is there within the company, um, what challenges are they facing. The 10K is a great, and I mean, I have to tell you, in 10 you, you CFOs, but I always tell, tell um, clients, before you contact the company, look at the 10K, see what um, challenges they've, they've written that are facing their industry, that are facing their company, that's valuable information to have when you go in to speak with somebody. Um, if you're asking about a particular position, um, no. What are, the, what are the full range of skills that are really required for a person to be successful in that position? If there's an incumbent who has been successful or not been successful, you want to know why? Um, there, there, there's publications which uh, show um, lists of good questions to ask. It's too much to say here in this setting. Uh, if you like um, such information, you can send me an email and uh, 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 provide it to you. Let's, let's uh, go a little farther. How do you keep in touch? We said it has to be an ongoing relationship. Contact them again after a month, after six weeks. Um, how do you do that? Uh, so we've been discussing that when you first speak with them, develop the relationship, and also build the basis for contacting them again. Ask, would you mind, could I have your contact information? Do you mind if I contact you again? And the contacting them again doesn't need to be an intrusion. Um, it could be something which they appreciate and build the relationship. First of all, any suggestion which they gave you, if they referred you to somebody, to a resource, to a person, to a book, to a website, come back. It's decency to say that you followed up on that suggestion and this is what resulted. I checked out that website. It was really interesting, really valuable. Thank you so much. Simple. And again, most people don't do it. You'll distinguish yourself besides the fact that it's decency. And that builds trust. And they see that you're worth their effort. And building such trust, investing in the relationship, um, they'll be willing to share more information with you. Sometimes the second, third, fourth time you're in touch with them, they'll be willing to share information which they would not have given, given out to a stranger the first few times you spoke to them. Um, share information that you came across. We gave that example already. This fellow who told me about somebody coming to CFO conference, I found it very interesting. And this also could be even uh, personal things uh, uh, in the area of uh, his hobbies or side interests. You, you saw an interesting article and you forwarded to him that the way of keeping in touch with the person, um, keeping in front of his mind, I'll tell you a story, you see the value of keeping in touch so that you remain in the front of his mind. My daughter was getting a flight to go back to seminary. My wife dropped her at the airport and turned around to come home. This was before cell phones. And my daughter calls me up at home. That uh, Although she was there on time, they, they didn't let her board. It's late at night, no more flights. What do we do? Long story short, I called my friend who lived near the airport. His wife answered, no problem. We'll pick her up. We'll bring her back in the morning. That worked. Meanwhile, where is my friend? I, I, He's not home. He's busy at the tuition committee uh, school for his children, discussing with them because he was uh, laid off. He's an IT person. He was laid off huh. the day before. I just went into somebody I hadn't seen for quite a while. What are you doing now? Ah, he's a recruiter, IT recruiter. Uh -huh. So the match was made, and uh, a job resulted from that. So since that person who I met yesterday was in the front of my mind, so I connected them. That's the value of being in the front of somebody's mind, and you're only there if you can keep in touch on a regular basis, not as a nudge, but giving something of value that the person appreciates. And other things you appreciate could be update on your status. He invested time speaking with you, advising you, let him know how you're doing, how your search is coming along, and show interest in anything that he's involved in that he shared with you, a project or whatever. And another way to keep in touch is, on special occasions, you send them a little note, and that way you keep in mind also. In his mind also. Now, important question. Mm, not saying a lot of people ask it, but it's an important question to ask. How do you measure the progress of your search? 
uh, some people say measure they sent out a hundred resumes I clicked through a hundred uh, ads uh, I went to 20 meetings if you remember George he was in a previous webinar he was the CFO of a major publishing firm he'd been on the street for a year looking for a job and when he came uh, to a new recruit new career coaching organization they said George how many interviews have you had with somebody who's at a level high enough to be able to hire you? Zero. Uh -huh. What has George accomplished in his search? No matter how many interviews he sent or how many meetings he had, how far along is he in his search? Zero meetings with the person who could hire you? There's a methodology which has been devised. It took years to develop. But it's a methodology not only for measuring your progress, more than that, for showing you what to aim for in building your search. Aim for an ongoing relationship, continuous function, with six to ten people at each stage. There are three stages. Stage one is people whom you speak to, networking contacts like we've been discussing this whole day, who are going to provide information for you in the areas that you're interested to find out about. Um, I didn't mention, and I should insert it over here, um, a very important set of questions to ask of people in this stage one level is um, at the point at which you've got your targets, you've got your companies that you selected. Um, run it by them if it seems like they'll be willing to take a look at it and um, ask. Seeing that list can jog their, 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 their thought process. A mind works by association. Seeing that list can give them ideas. Oh, you know what company's not on here? And they'll think of a few other companies that you should be contacting. And ask also the companies on this list. Um, do you know about them? What's doing inside? Are they strong? They're well organized. Is it a good place to work? Should you would you advise that I yes pursue uh, going after that company? Should I not? Might you know somebody in that company whom I could contact? Could I use your name? These are very valuable questions to ask at people in stage one when you're getting information. Also, present your resume sometimes to get it to get an impression about. Um, how it comes across. Is it coming across the way you intended to come across? Stage two is really the goal. You're aiming to get networking meetings with the right people at the right level. Like we said, George wasn't getting, but that's what you want to get. Six to ten people, the right people at the right level who can hire you, even if they do not have an opening now. But if they're looking at your skills, they say, wow, look at this background. I wish we had an opening. We'd hire you tomorrow then your search is working like clockwork. Get 10, get 20. Get as much of these type of contacts as you can because when you're doing that, then eventually you'll be speaking to the right people at the right level at the right time when they have an opening or they're able to create an opening for you. That's a big part of the reason why 80% of the jobs that are offered were never advertised because they did not exist till they met you and your skill set and your personality and they said we're going to create a position for that person because he could be valuable on our staff. That's the goal. Stage two, focus to get to that point. And it's not always exactly chronological. Sometimes maybe the second, third person you meet in your networking building might be a stage two person. No problem, <laughs> no problem, but you're aiming to build up a uh, uh, six to ten people in stage one and in stage two eventually getting you to stage three. Now, the ultimate aim is um, to aim for concurrent offers, three or more concurrent offers. It's amazing. As much as people realize that um, being employed versus not employed, there's such a bias, such a prejudice. Some companies said if you're not employed, don't apply here. They, they like a person who's employed. Yesterday he was employed and, and today he was laid off. He's the same skill set. There's a prejudice. 
So you find also that uh, there's a prejudice in favor of somebody who has an offer. Oh, they want him, I want him. <laughs> you become very, very desirable uh, once you have one offer. And just think in terms of yourself. You have an offer. You feel like a different person. You, you have bread in your basket, so to speak. And if you go interview someplace else, you'll go with such a confidence. Because you're not banking on them. You don't need them. You have an offer. You come in much more confidently, and that comes across, and that itself does a lot to sell you. Because think for yourself when you interview somebody. You sense an air of confidence, not cocking, not, not, not haughtiness, real confidence. You get confidence in that person. He'll be able to do what you need of him if he has the right skills, or he'll get the skills. Um, so having an offer is valuable. Besides the fact that you can use it to leverage, right? When an offer is forthcoming from this company, you have already three offers, you say, you know, I'd love to work for this company. I like the people over here. I like the organization. I see how I could fit in. I see how I could contribute. But, you know, I have this other offer. Let's talk and see if it makes sense, uh, dollars and cents, for me to sign on over here when I have this kind of offer and you can leverage one against the other and really, really um, help a lot in the salary negotiation when you're at this point having concurrent offers. Okay, this is the prepared presentation. And um, if you have any questions, we'll be glad to try to answer them. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Moshe. That was great information. <clears throat> Before we transition to the Q&A portion of the webinar, we're going to launch our polling questions. We'd appreciate everyone's consideration and answers our poll on answering the polling questions, and it will help drive the Q&A for today's webinar. For those of you in the audience, in after CPE credits today, you'll need to answer both of the both of the polling questions. As a reminder, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Moshe, please ask it via the questions area in your GoToWebinar control panel. What I'll do is I'll just go ahead and um, launch the polling questions and go ahead and begin. Uh, the Q&A with Moshe in order to uh, take full advantage of the, our time here uh, this afternoon. So the first polling question uh, has come up. So uh, our first question um, for Moshe uh, is, is really, uh, I guess, um, on the sincerity side. So, so let's say you have a, a networking meeting for someone that was, pre that was premised on that you liked uh, their blog posting. Uh, how do you transition um, that, you know, to, a, to, to them kind of helping you find a job and not feel like, have someone feel like they pulled, you pulled the bait switch on them? Yeah, it's a good question. You have to be straight. You have to be straight with the person. Otherwise, like we said, it's not going to build trust for an ongoing relationship. You have to be straight and um, let him know what your intent is. Um, we mentioned two different intents that it might be that I'm not looking now, but I'm looking to build out my network. I'm being proactive. Uh, because I realize that that could be available in the future, either in the information, the skills that this person could provide to me, or in really having a network of people whom I can rely upon when I should need it. I could let him know that's also part of my intent, or if I am looking. So uh, let him know that uh, the information that I'm seeking from him is so that I could know how to better position myself, be better informed about uh, which companies, which industries to pursue, like we gave an example of, um, you know, in, uh, information that he knew about that company, international information that can help me to better pursue my search, be straight and upfront with, uh, up with the person so that he realizes that um, that is your intent. And like you said, he shouldn't feel um, like, you, like you pulled the wool over his eyes, like you took advantage of him. But, but be sincere in, the, in, in that information that you're requesting. Um, it should be something that's valuable to you. Right? Don't just pick out something as a, just an excuse to get into networking. Be sincere and pick out information which, which is a necessary information. OK, great. Um, move on to our next uh, question here. Um, and, th and this is one that I've had personal experience with. I can remember my previous job searches. Um, when you have a networking meeting, how do you decide uh, when it's best uh, to to deliver your resume to someone, how, how do you pass along that information and look sincere in that in that respect? What? How do, when do you decide to give your resume? Yeah. Okay. Uh, who says you should give your resume? 
Who says you shouldn't? Maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. First of all, um, I, I would not submit it initially unless requested. But um, I, I, we mentioned, do be prepared with your pitch. In that pitch, you've given the gist of the information which is contained in your resume. The resume is, is more detailed. But you should have a picture of your skills, of your value proposition from that pitch which you delivered. And by the way, we're talking about a resume. Is it necessary? Is it not necessary? Um, even in applying for a position, a resume is not always necessary. Um, recently, two different clients. One client I, I advised not to use a traditional resume because his resume is um, not the strongest at the world's body, and he would do better with a brief description of his value proposition. Um, another client, his resume is very strong. And I advised him also. He has a paragraph written up. He paid somebody, wrote it up beautifully. A paragraph stating clearly what he does and, and what his value is, his quantified accomplishments. And in his case, it's a simpler, more compelling um, uh, message than uh, what he would have in a, in a, even in a good resume. So for him also, I advise that he should go ahead and use that instead of a resume. So I didn't make that up. This up. It's something which is done. In fact, it was done by um, William Cohn. He's an author and a business manager. He's a disciple of um, Peter Drucker, and uh, he's held big positions. He was um, head of R and D at Boeing Corporation, and in, in one of his jobs transitions, he experimented. To half of the places, he sent a resume. To half of the places, he sent um, a, a little write-up of his value proposition. He got more response from that write-up than he got from his resume. So a resume is not, uh, is not, is not um, required in all cases. Back to your question. I'm sorry for the long um, lecture over here. but. Um, yeah, I would initially give the, the, the pitch and uh, definitely do have a resume available. Um, in fact, if you've contacted the person first by email and then you're going to speak later, um, you might think about including it as an attachment if he wants to read it, um, maybe prior to your, to, to your scheduled meeting. Uh, otherwise, have it with you. Um, and in case the conversation comes around, to information, which is there on your resume, you pull it out as the source of information. Uh, so you have to kind of feel that out if it would seem to be appropriate in the circumstance or not. OK, um, great. Um, uh, our next question, uh, I just want to follow up on, on the resume uh, question just a little bit. So, so, so you mentioned you know, that one of the people you were working with uh, didn't have you know, what you would consider uh, strong resume. Uh, do you have any particular, um, maybe a two or three things um, that you see that just kind of are resume killers or things that people don't have on the resume that you think makes it makes it look poor in comparison? So there's two questions. Things that are missing or things that are there which shouldn't be there. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Um, chronolo chronology is always an issue, right? If there's gaps in the chronology, so uh, a functional resume can avoid that um, and things which which things which are missing that should be there I would say most resumes are missing um, the top third of the space that's your resume in good clear print it should say everything that the person needs to know about you which is not many words. Like we said, your positioning. That PDA should be all summarized concisely and clearly right there. You have a 15-second pitch. That should be at the top of the resume. If he's interested, and hopefully it's compelling and he will be, then he'll scan farther down to see the details, see more details about those quantified accomplishments that you alluded to. I think most resumes are missing that. A very strong positioning statement right at the top. So that grabs his attention. Don't make him study it and see what you could do for him. Tell him 
right up front what you could do for him and why, because here's the quantified accomplishments that I've done it before. Okay, great. Um, um, someone has an interesting uh, question um, uh, that I uh, have as well, um, have had as well, and I've spent some time with this. Um, regarding um, LinkedIn and your profile, uh, can you speak to uh, what you think the value of, of having uh, recommendations on LinkedIn uh, would do for the person and the value of requesting those to get those on your LinkedIn profile? Uh -huh. The value of recommendations, if they're good recommendations, is, is fantastic. I started keeping a file. Um, years ago, somehow I got this idea. Um, my manager handed me a printed copy. He didn't forward the email. A printed copy of a recommendation that he had sent to his superior regarding my work. And I thanked him. I took the copy and I put it in a file. And since then, I've been adding to the file. Anytime there are comments that you get from your supervisors, from your subordinates, from your clients, internal clients, external clients, keep it. Um, that's very, very useful. I spoke once to the recruiter. I brought that stuff with me. That was great. Um, on your resume, you could put at the bottom, instead of, re instead of references re available upon request, you say, you, you say, here's what they say about me. And take a few quotes. That's very powerful. People, people who work with you, who are responsible for you, whatever, who will benefit from you, your clients, this is what they say. That's a very, very valuable thing. Question is, you know, how much you want to bother people um, to do it? Uh, uh, that's 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 your judgment call. But having having such things is definitely valuable. No, thanks. Uh, just to add a, a little color uh, on that comment, um, you know, from from my experience uh, in the professional development arena, it is very valuable to have that on your profile. Uh, you know, and 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 especially to have you know a, a wide range. So if you have multiple jobs, have two or three. Uh, strong recommendations, and I and, and I think there is value, you know, in, in reaching out to folks if you feel that they could give you a strong recommendation, but they have to be, you know, someone that you've you know done work with, and, and sometimes it's a it's a reciprocal um, type of you know type of relationship. So maybe you can offer a value to them on that front as well. Uh, have another question. Um, someone's asking. Uh, you know, some of the folks that may have uh, been um, out there a, a while and, and may be looking, and, and, and it may not be that, that they may be employed, but it may just be that they want to um, transition to a different company. Um, do you have any um, thoughts around um, someone taking uh, a position at what some might see uh, as, a, as, as, a lo as a lower level? Say you have an interview um, for that lower level uh, position. Um, how, do you, how would you position that as far as over qualification? Is concerned. Okay, something like you sound, it sounds like you're talking about a person remaining within his own industry and taking a lower position, because um, changing industries, uh, I think it's in many, many most cases a given. You'll have to go down in order to change in change industries until you can hopefully quickly gear up, get up to speed in the new context, the new the new industry until you get back to your own level. But even within your own industry, you're asking about. Um, going to interview for a position which is a step down. Um, ultimately, to, to accept such a position depends on um, the circumstances surrounding your, your current status. If it's, uh, if it's shaky, if you can't take it anymore, et cetera, et cetera, something driving you uh, out of where you are. However, um, to go and interview for such a position, I would say there should be little reluctance to go and interview for a position which sounds that it's below your your level, because um, you know we saw that picture about 80% of the jobs that are hidden. This they just open the door for you. Don't close the door before you go in. Go in, talk to them, see what's doing over there, see what they need, and once you're there and they see the skills that you have, they may say, oh, we don't need him for this level uh, level uh, four position. We want him for a level uh, six position. Put him up higher. Look what he could do for us. He's much more valuable. Right? And like that, you, you never even have to go ahead and uh, discuss the salary. It's a, it's a cost because you grew the responsibility of the position. Obviously, the salary grew right along with it. And you're back up there where you want it to be. Never um, refrain from going to a position 
and which looks lower because you may very well leverage it up. Unless, of course, you have so many positions that you're busy going to that you can't be bothered with this one. And the chance maybe it's going to go up because the other ones are already higher. But um, in case each uh, you know opportunity that you have is valuable, definitely um, go for it and keep that in mind that uh, you try to build it up to be something that's at your skill level. And if not in the offer, talk about six months out, a year out, what are the growth prospects in this company? Okay. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead um, and share uh, the, one of the some questions, uh, one of the polling questions, Moshe, and like to uh, get your thoughts um, on the on the poll, on the results of the polling question. Um, mm -hmm. So the question um, um, is around those in the audience identifying the potential way that they uh, would find uh, their job opportunity, and uh, just would like to get your thoughts on whether those are surprising or if you have any comments uh, around that. I'm glad to see your professional network ranks very highly. It makes a lot of sense because that's what we've been discussing today, to use your networking to get into those, um, those positions that are not, off, not, not advertised. And uh, professional associations really could be lumped in there also so that um, you're showing 50% of the people using their networking and 30% um, of them uh, using, you know, Monster, um, maybe we'll assume that it's, you know, for finding job postings, we said 10 or 20 uh, of the percent of the opportunities are there, but um, maybe the other 10% of their time is because it's working for them or because they're using it as market research um, to see which companies are posting and then go ahead and network their way into the company through other means, not just clicking through. Or um, maybe it's those people who didn't attend this lecture and they're putting all of their time into clicking through online sites. OK, uh, great. Um, and I got a kind of a follow-up question there. So, and, uh, and we've all probably have been in these shoes before at some point uh, in our career. Let's just say um, that I'm one of the folks in the uh, 33 uh, percent that use Monster Career Builder and Moshe has opened my eyes to the value of these, you know, these other vehicles, and I'm just kind of like overwhelmed. Um, what do you say, you know, are some beginning steps for someone um, to to get started um, in in leveraging these other vehicles and building their network so they don't get overwhelmed? Okay, good question. Take small steps. Take one thing at a time. Um, yeah, I, I was last night with a client who felt overwhelmed at the prospect of assessment and targeting and everything. But take one step at a time. You know, it, there's a stairway. You, you don't go from the first floor to the second floor. They don't expect you to jump there. That's why they make stairs. You take one step at a time. Um, pick out one person um, whom you think could be a valuable networking contact and talk to the person. Do a little homework, make a list of what type of questions you think would be the appropriate questions to ask that person um, and practice it. You'll improve with iterations. Your list will get better. It should grow. You should scratch out some questions, add new questions. Um, so start small like that. Practice. You gain confidence. and. Uh, even probably begin to enjoy it and look forward to having uh, additional opportunities. Um, thank you very much, Moshe. Uh, in the sake of time, I'd like to close uh, the Q&A session. Um, I'd like to thank Moshe Kravitz for his time and insight. Uh, the audience members, if you'd like us to connect you with Moshe, please indicate that on the survey. We'll ask you to take. That will pop up uh, after the webinar is, is over, or if you would choose uh, to leave the webinar. Uh, Moshe is excellent source of information on today's topic. Uh, again, um, regarding CPE credits, you'll see on the screen now, if you have any questions around CPE credits, please email Tanya Walsh at twalsh at performative.com. She will get you those CPE certificates. Again, we'd appreciate your consideration in taking the survey that will, that will pop up after we end the webinar. We really appreciate your feedback, and we're always trying to improve the ROI that we offer those that attend uh, our events. And finally, 
and I would like to thank the audience for your valuable time and insight, and we hope to see you on performative.com and at future events. Um, with that, I'll, I will close down the webinar with this parting thought. Uh, please make it a great day, everyone, and have a great weekend. We appreciate your support of Performative.